But I was saying that's different from the prep, like the drink, right? Or well, is that the, the colonoscopy, same? no, that's that's the prep. Okay. The bowel prep they okay. take, you want it to be like clear liquid, mm -hmm. but no red, orange, or purple. All right. But okay. It's, okay. it's what the prep does to them. It gives them massive diarrhea. That's why they get metabolic uh, acid. Right. Okay. And then with these E E tests, like E G D and E R C P, okay. The most important thing about these tests is you got to check a gag reflex when they come back from the procedure because they anesthetize like the back of the throat and they sedate them. So you want to make sure they have a gag reflex so they don't aspirate. That's the most important thing. Uh, okay. um, and the other two tests aren't that important. But that the, those are important points on those tests. Um, and then you now non-inflammatory bowel disease mm -hmm. it's coming in it's loading yeah they're telling me to send the link i'm, I'm multitasking over here i sent in an email they should have it yeah that's what i told them let me see so mm -hmm. make sure you understand the proper sequence of um of assessment for the abdomen right you want to inspect first okay. then auscultate because you have to listen before you can touch the belly because once you right. touch the belly you're, you're going to cause out. noises right percussion right. and then palpation you don't want to palpate until last because if the patient's in pain they're not going to let you anyway so you can remember the phrase i am perfect pal you have to know the uh, sequence and then with okay. the hernias, what's important with the hernias is there's all there's a lot of different types of hernias, right? But what you want to mm -hmm. know is is it reducible or is it non-reducible, which we call incarcerated. So if you can move this back in, then it's reducible. You don't need to worry about it. If you cannot move it back to place, it's irreducible, which we also call incarcerated. They need a surgical evaluation because this could lead to bowel obstruction. Okay. And then with the strangulated um, hernia, see, this is a loop of bowel that's come out and it's strangulated. So it's going to get ischemic and necrotic. So that's an important finding. So it's important for you to know that, you know, if somebody has one of these obstructive type um, bowels, they're going to have tachycardia. They'll get abdominal distension and the vomit may smell like a fecal material and they'll have a fever okay okay so that so see how this looks like the blood is all cut off to this area so you got to watch out because they're at risk of um, obstruction necrosis and perforation so like the bowel can rupture because of that now there's okay. two types of obstruction one is called mechanical um, and that's mechanical is like what you think, like strangulation or vulvalus, intersuspension. You're going to learn about that in pediatrics. It's telescoping of is, the bowel. Is that, uh, is that when the poop, oh, sorry. Is that that's when the okay. poop, the in, intersuspension, does that, is that when the poop looks like jelly? Uh, no, I that's, right? I don't know what that one is, but um, current jelly, yeah, I can't remember what that one is. It might. I'm okay, not I always sure. Um, up. Let me. See. I'm about to Google it. Mm. Yeah, and then so they're okay. going to need surgery, and then non-mechanical obstruction is a paralytic ileus, like if somebody has surgery. So to know they're getting better, they would pass flatus. Flatus is really good to know if, if your patient has flatus because it means that there's peristalsis. All right. Now, when okay. you listen to their bowel sounds, because what you're worried about with obstruction is um, the obstruction, you got to get ahead of it because they could rupture their bowel and get peritonitis and die. OK, so what you're going to okay. hear if somebody has an obstruction is high pitched tinkling sounds above the obstruction in one quadrant and then hypoactive bowel sounds below that quadrant. So it's going to be high tinkling, pitch sounds, and then 
hypoactive. Hypoactive sounds are like um, you only hear a bowel sound like every 30 seconds, okay? And that could be normal, but if you have high pitch tinkling sounds and then you have hypoactive in another area, then you probably have an intestinal um, obstruction. So I told you, remember uh, the order of abdominal assessment. Okay, yeah. And then GERD. So GERD, GERD, peptic ulcer disease, and uh, gastritis are kind of similar, right? It's, it could be due to H. pylori. Um, it could be due to chronic, uh, not steroids, chronic NSAID use. Um, but with GERD, something weakens the lower esophageal sphincter, which is right here. If you look at this picture here, right? So when it's mm -hmm. weakened, the acid can climb back up. Okay, and um, it's it, your patient can aspirate on this actually, so that's not good. So some of the risk factors, people that are obese or pregnant because that presses uh, and on the structures like the stomach and um, it weakens the lower esophageal uh, sphincter, okay? So, okay. okay. yeah, so they may have an endoscopy test. They're um, gonna be on antacids. Remember with antacids, actually, remember with PPIs, they take it every day, not just PRN, whereas antacids, they might take PRN. Um, okay. So your nursing interventions, this is the important thing. First of all, tell them to stop eating irritating foods, like just across the board, like alcohol, caffeine, NSAIDs. Mm. Uh, what else? And alcohol, caffeine, and said smoking. All those are like gastric irritants, alcohol as well, spicy foods. You know, they're going to need to eliminate that. Um, they're going to need a low fat diet because uh, you don't want the food. The more fat you eat, the longer it's going to stay in your stomach and the more chance that the patient is going to have reflux. So they need to be at least NPO two hours before they go to bed, which is different than dumping syndrome. So make sure you know that distinction. Raise the head of the bed six to eight inches. Eat a low fat diet. Tell them not to wear tight clothes and no smoking, drinking, or using caffeine. With, um, and they can get, um, let me see, is this the hiatal hernia? No, but they can get the, uh, somebody with a hi hiatal hernia, you know, it's like above here, above the sphincter they have the same nursing interventions, okay? So they just, it's treated okay. very similar. And then with the ulcers, what you're worried about, two things, they can either perforate or bleed. So you're worried about those two things. Now, a gastric ulcer, um, it, the patient gets pain when they eat. So like 30 to 60 minutes after they eat. Now, with an duodenal ulcer, when they first eat, they feel pretty good, but it's mm -hmm. three hours later. So they're the ones that wake up in the middle of the night, duodenal, because the small intestine is a little further down. Now, with gastric ulcer, they may um, vomit like coffee grounds or have, uh, you know, hematomesis, whereas duodenal ulcer are going to have the dark tarry stools and GI bleeding. So you're going to be monitoring for those kinds of signs and symptoms. And they, you know, across the board, anybody with any one of these problems needs to avoid alcohol, caffeine, smoking, um, spicy foods, soda, um, just because those those types of foods are irritable. Okay. And you probably had, you had this in funds, um, just a couple things. There's a lot of different ways we can feed people. If if a physician provider has a choice between enteral and parental feeding, they are always going to go with enteral feeding because you always want to use the gut if it's working. Um, when I worked in ICU, we, we started people on low volume feedings right away, even if they didn't have bowel sounds, because it protects them from infection. It, it helps them get stronger. Um, so that they can fight whatever it is they have. So enteral feedings are really a good thing. Um, the reason we don't like parental as much is they can get very septic from it, so you have to be careful. Um, so feedings can be intermittent, intermittent or continuous. 
Um, if you have a disposable bag like this, this needs to be um, changed every 24 hours. And that's been an ATI question before. The other thing is, if you, if you have a bag like this, you're putting in, you know, um, formula from a can, the feeding from a can. Make sure it's room temperature so the patient doesn't get cramps. And um, you never put more than four hours in this bag, four hours worth of, of um, feeding in the bag. All right. And they have a lot of nice pre-made feedings now where you can hang this for 24 hours, the whole thing. Um, okay. When you're using a nasogastric tube, you have an all feeding tubes. You need to look at the x-ray report to make sure it's placed accurately, okay, because you don't want it in the lungs. This is called a Salem sump tube. It's a double lumen nasogastric tube. This is the piggy tail, okay? You keep it above the waist, don't infuse anything in it, and don't clamp. So I know that this has shown up as like a picture on Proctor before. Um, so what you always want to do with anybody that has a feeding tube is you're going to check the placement. And you're going to do that by checking the chest x-ray, but also the markings on the tube and make sure they're where they're supposed to be, like to the nose, you know? Like it's supposed to be at the 52 centimeter mark. Make sure it's at the 52 centimeter mark because it could have moved. Assess their bowel sounds. Um, keep the head of the bed up 30 degrees at all times when they're feeding uh, and one hour after. So you want to make sure you're giving good mouth care. If they can't swallow, of course, you're going to be suctioning as well. Um, okay. okay, here are the complications. Overfeeding, what you're going to do with that is check the residuals, whether it's bolus feeding or continuous every four to six hours you're going to hold for a residual greater than 100 to 200 mLs and then follow the, you know, just make sure you hold it because they're not, they're not going to tolerate that and they may vomit. They could get diarrhea um, in most patients on tube feedings do, but you're going to have to, if that does happen, you're going to end up, you know, probably letting the provider know and you're going to send a stool sample for a C. diff. Aspiration, it, it, with the tube feeding is always going to be at risk for aspiration so and usually it's the tube displacement that's the primary cause that's why i said in the beginning like make sure you're checking that the tube is where it's supposed to be right it's at the 52 centimeter uh right nasal um there so that you that you want to know that so you can check it keep the head of the bed up monitor their temps and their uh, lung sounds to make sure they're not getting pneumonia uh, and refeeding syndrome, that can cause seizures and weakness. Uh, the most common things I think you're going to come in, in touch with in your career is overfeeding, diarrhea, and aspiration. Those are going to be the most important for you. And then with TPN, uh, there are a lot of classic kind of questions that they ask about TPN. So with TPN, it has to go through a central line. You're going to save a port on the central line if they're going to have TPN because you don't want anything else going in that port because TPN has greater than 10% dextrose in bacteria love sugar, right? So they're going to be a high risk for infection. So you never speed up the TPN and you never slow it. You never slow it down or stop it abruptly. Now, when you do taper it, like when they're going to go off of it, you taper it down. When they start, you, um, you know, taper it up, okay? So you don't just start it at the full rate. You're going to monitor the electrolytes daily. Um, you, it's a double checker, meaning you hang it with another nurse and you check the order and you make sure it's correct. Um, gradual increase in taper with, you know, starting and DCing it. The patient needs to be on daily weights. You keep dextrose 10% IV fluid in the room. Be, and we don't really do that, but that's like what the intervention is um, in the NCLEX world. Because if the if you run out of TPN, you have to hang this D10 or they're going to get hypoglycemic. You're going to check glucose to four to six hours. Even non-diabetics are going to have high glucose on TPN because the glucose is so concentrated. Um, and then they'll get regular insulin. They'll be on a sliding scale and change the bag and tubing every 24 hours. 
Now the complications of this is fluid overload. And the reason is TPN has a high um, osmolarity. So it's going to pull fluid in from the periphery into the vascular space, and it could cause fluid overload, air embolism, hypoglycemia, and of course, infection is the other thing that is bothersome. So those are important points. Now with bariatric surgery, I used to work in a center of excellence for bariatrics, and this surgery is amazing because I saw people go from like taking all these medications and into Two, three days later, they were off all their antihypertensive medications, off all their diabetic medications, and they were looking forward to a new life. So it is kind of amazing. Um, so the qualifications, you have to have a BMI greater than 40 or greater than 35 with a comorbidity like, like diabetes or hypertension. There's two types of surgery. There's a restrictive type of surgery, and these are like your lap bands or your lap sleeves. Um, anything like with a band in it, vertical. Um, so, and then you have your malabsorption surgeries, and these aren't done as much anymore. This is your Roux and Y gastric bypass. So they take out like portions of your stomach and they kind of reroute stuff. Um, so they're going to be at risk. All bariatric patients with malabsorption surgeries are going to have to um, take B12 for the rest of their lives, calcium. Um, and iron. So they're going to be high risk for DVTs. Um, and the complications, okay, this is important because this can kill them early. Uh, anastomotic leak. So that's a leak of the anastomosis that the surgeon does. The anastomosis is when they sew like one organ to another, right? It, it's like the sewing, the sutures. So if they have a leak, they're going to have increasing back or shoulder pain and tachycardia. Tachycardia is a sign that your body is stressed and needs something, okay? So anytime somebody gets tachycardic, you better pay attention and try to figure out what is causing the tachycardia. Um, they can get very restless because it's painful and um, they it's, it's quite uncomfortable and then they can get oligarch, but make sure if you see any of these signs and symptoms, you're going to call the provider immediately. And you never manipulate a nasogastric tube that was inserted by a surgeon during surgery because they know where the sutures are. Say you come in and manipulate it and you see these suture lines right here. If you put that tube down too far and poke this, you could like essentially, um, you know, put a hole in their stomach. So you never manipulate a nasogastric tube that was put in by a surgeon. You want to monitor for all the things okay. that happen after, that can happen after any surgery, like atelectasis, DVT. They can definitely be at risk for an incisional hernia and peritonitis. Peritonitis, you need to make sure you understand the signs and symptoms of peritonitis. They're going to have tachycardia. Um, tachypnea, they're going to be in pain, they're, they're going to have abdominal maybe bloating or distension, tender abdomen, they're going to be guarding it because it hurts so bad. But when you hear board like abdomen, then you know that board like abdomen is like the um, the hallmark sign of peritonitis, and it happens in a lot of conditions we're talking about, right? Remember, peritoneal dialysis, they can get peritonitis. So that's important. Um, when they first, like when they, uh, right after surgery, they can only drink about three M, uh, 30 mLs at a time and they eat six small meals a day. Now they do not drink while they eat. They, they keep it separate. And the reason is they want to pre uh, prevent dumping syndrome. So with dumping syndrome, again, they're going to get tachycardic because they're under stress. They get crampy, diaphoretic, palpitations, and fatigue. So what you tell them to do to prevent dumping is withhold all PO fluids during the meal, okay? So they can have it after 60 minutes. And then um, you want to make sure they're limiting sweet drinks. Uh, and even like milk, milk can cause dumping syndrome. So encourage them to eat six meals a day. They need to eat slowly chew very well. 
They're going to lie down after meals, okay, which is different than GERD, so make sure you understand that. And this is to slow the stomach emptying. Um, they need a high-protein, high-fat, low-fiber, and low-carb diet. So this dumping syndrome is a hot topic on uh, ATI, and I would definitely make sure you know all that information um, about the patient teaching. Okay, stomatitis has nothing to do with the stomas I'm going to talk about, but it's inflammation of the mouth. Um, and like people with renal disease can get this. Um, people that had chemo can get this, and it's often a proctor topic. Okay, so it's inflammation of the mouth. And some of the chemotherapy therapeutic agents, when I worked on an oncology floor, one of the things we used to, have to do is take a flashlight and look in people's mouths because. If they started getting stomatitis, we had to stop the chemo. It's very painful. So they need to avoid spicy and salty foods, acidic foods, anything that's going to irritate the mouth. All right. They want you want them to eat cold and bland foods and also like mashed potato consistency. So scrambled eggs, cooked, cooked cereal. You want to avoid those lemon and glycerol swabs for the mouth because they have alcohol and that's going to dry their mouth out. Um, so basically, they need to use room temp water to, to like um, rinse their mouth out and they have to um, use soft toothbrushes. So when we now we'll go down to ostomy. So there's kind of like three flavors of ostomy. So there's a colostomy, which is the big, large colon. Um, and then there's an ileostomy, which is the small colon and the urostomy, which drains urine. OK. Now, this is important. Stoma should be shiny, red, wet, or moist, um, protruding out from the skin. Um, and it'll be round over. It can be a lot of different shapes, okay? But the most important thing is, is that it's not like a purple, black, or because um, you want to make sure it's not necrotic, okay? So the colonoscopy can have like four different um, places that it can go. And I know ATI loves to say, ask students, where's the transverse col uh, colostomy? Where is that? Um, and then the ileostomy would be down here. I think, yes, I have a picture of that over here. All right. So um, as, as like these ostomies, as the stool's coming around, see when it's here, like ileostomy and ascending, it's semi, semi solid to it liquid. And then when it comes around, it, it gets like a little more uh, consistent, I guess, consistency as it comes around. And then finally, more like um, more like a, uh, you know, stool that you probably would uh, recognize right here. OK, this is a loop uh, ostomy in this. All this means is this can be temporary and they can put this back together. OK, and this is a double barrel. Double barrel is different than a loop. This is put back together. This is taking the ends out of both and putting them to the skin. Okay, so the most important things about the um, ileostomies is that with the ileostomy, it's low. It's in the right lower quadrant, um, and they can't control it, so it's not like a constant um, device. They're going to have high output. So they need to, um, you know, make sure they're keeping up with their fluid. Koch's procedure, this is a cotton and ileostomy. Surgeon makes a pouch. This is a red rubber catheter. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but this is like what you would straight cat somebody with urine. I don't know what your, your question was on your, on your practice, but I noticed a lot of people got this wrong about picking a catheter for straight cathing. And this is the type of catheter. You would not pick one with a balloon on it for if you're going to just straight cath in and out and then there's all kinds of urostomies too so one is in indiana pouch and i took care of somebody at Leahy clinic that had this um and it was like one of the first in the country it's a continent urostomy and then the ilia conduit is made out of a piece of bowel so the important things about that is there's going to be mucus in the urine if they have one of these devices. So in terms of a new stoma, you want to teach the patient to inspect it, and you should do. 
um, the patient's not going to feel anything on it. So like if there's pressure because they don't have nerve endings. So you need to check it frequently, make sure um, it's a good color. So it should be pink to red and moist. Okay. Should protrude a little bit, make sure it's not bleeding. And when you're cutting the appliance, you cut it at one eighth inch or one sixteen, larger than the stoma to prevent constriction. You need to report pale, dark red, purple, brown, or black to the surgeon ASAP. That's super important to make sure you're watching out that's for that stoma. Okay, with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's versus colitis. So with Crohn's, it's if you remember this, it's gum to the bum. So it's all, it's the whole entire GI tract, gum to the bum. Okay, so it's the whole thing. Where when you talk about ulcerative colitis, it's only colon. They're both autoimmune diseases. Nobody really knows what causes it. Jewish people um, have a high prevalence of this. Um, know where the signs are, where the pain is. So with Crohn's, the pain is in the right lower quadrant with cramping. With ulcerative colitis, it's in the left lower quadrant. Um, with Crohn's, they can have like diarrhea, anorexia, uh, and weight loss. And with colitis, they have like a um, bloody stool. Um, and it can be quite pro prolific. They can go a lot. So, you know, one of your, one of the things you would be doing is, you know, um, monitoring their stools definitely um with crohn's disease they try not to do surgery because it's only a temporary solution whereas with ulcerative colitis they can do a full colectomy and cure the patient of ulcer ulcerative colitis and oftentimes if they don't have their large colon out then they will end up with um cancer so that's a good reason to do it they need to eat a low fiber, high protein uh, with, you know, adequate fluids. So that's important to know that they need that. So low fiber, high protein and fluids. Um, they should avoid like alcohol, obviously, gas producing foods. Um, they'll be on meds. Um, you want to. OK, so you're going to weigh them daily. Make sure they're on I and O. Check the BM characteristics, especially if there's blood in it and the frequency of it. Because, like I said, all sort of colitis, if they're having a flare up, both of these diseases, they have um, periods of exacerbation and remission. So if they're having like a flare up, they could be, you know, going to the bathroom a lot. Uh, bowel sounds, check those and teach them ostomy care if they have surgery. Now with appendicitis, just a couple of things. Um, it's usually pain in the right lower quadrant. It can radiate from the umbilicus down to here. This is called McBurney's point. Um, and that's like a famous point um, that you might see it. So one of the complications is peritonitis. So remember, tachycardia, distension, abdominal tenderness with guarding, high WBC in the board-like abdomen. You never put a heating pad because you on the patient because the appendix may rupture and if it does rupture they're gonna they're gonna feel no pain so that's not a good thing if your patient before surgery tells you that they don't feel pain anymore that's not good and especially with young women you have to make sure you know this is taken care of right away because that can make them sterile if they if their uh, appendicitis ruptures so Diverticulosis and diverticulitis, okay, it's inevitable. Older people have these output pouchings in the colon. And diverticulitis is when these out pouchings become inflamed. The pain is going to be in the left lower quadrant. They're going to need low fiber, progressing to high fiber diet. So low fiber when they have an exacerbation. And they shouldn't eat nuts or seeds because they can get caught in here. Um, so those are the important parts there. How are you? Have you been able to study like um, the biliary tree? Uh, no, I haven't even gotten that far yet. Okay, mm -hmm. want to go over that? Sure.
I think yes, it's a good please. amount of people in here too. So I'm not going okay. to list. All right. So let's go to the biliary tree. All right, I just give giving you some like landmarks here and um, just some little background information. Okay, so you know you have the liver up here in the in the right upper quadrant and the gallbladder is under here. And the reason I'm telling you this is because when people have gallbladder disease, they get they can get colicky pain that radiates up to the right shoulder. Okay, so that's like a thing with gallbladder. Right shoulder pain can happen. Um, and so this is just, you know, showing you where everything is. And this is just showing you the biliary tree, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas right here, okay? So now if you come over here just quickly, the gallbladder um, stores about 50 mLs of bile for us that is used to help us um, digest fats, okay? So you eat a fatty meal, your gallbladder starts to contract, it puts bile out to the cystic duct. It goes down the common bile duct and into the duodenum. Okay. And that's what gives stool the color. Okay. People who are at risk for gallbladder disease include people that have the characteristics of the six Fs. They're fair, which means white, fat, 40, female. They, it runs in their family and they're fertile. Estrogen, like people on birth control pills or people that have had twins or just had a baby are at risk for um, gallbladder disease as well. So the signs and symptoms include pain in the right upper quadrant with radiation to the shoulder after eating high fat foods. Because it's an itis, meaning there's inflammation, the patient's going to have a temperature. They're going to have a white blood cell count they'll have what's called Murphy sign. Murphy sign is indicative of gallbladder disease. And, you know, the provider would do that. They, they press on right underneath the liver and the patient has pain. They're going to have nausea and vomiting, um, eructication, which is burping, flatulence, which I think you know what that is. And um, they, can, they can either, the treatment is e either going to be nothing or they may say, hey, go on a low-fat diet, eat low gassy foods that don't cause gas, uh, lose some weight, have medications. They could use ESWL, which is shockwave therapy, and surgery. That's what they would treat it with. Now, you and I could both have gallstones, and we don't even know it. The gallstones don't always bother people. It's when they cause irritation in the gallbladder, and it causes cholecystitis that we worry about it. Okay. Um, so, and I'll talk about the pancreas when I get there. So again, cholecystitis, it can be acute or chronic. We're going to just focus on really acute cholecystitis. Okay. It can be with stones or without stones. Um, people that get it without stones are really critically ill, so we're going to just pay attention to acute. Um, and remember, birth control pills can put you more at risk. Um, and if you're pregnant, you're more at risk. And if you had a lot of babies recently, you're more at risk. Also, if you eat a high fatty diet, you're going to be at risk. If your BMA, BMI is greater than 30, you'll be at risk. Um, so people that go on like crazy liquid diets and stuff, they can be at risk too because when you do that, it stresses your liver out, raises your cholesterol, and it puts you at risk for cholecystitis. Um, so don't do that. People that have sedentary lifestyles are at risk. I mentioned the six Fs. This is super uh, important to know. Fat, 40, female, fer fertile, right? Remember people on birth control pills, people pregnancy, uh, family history and fair. So there's really six P's. F's, I mean six F's. Rapid weight loss. I talked about that. That leads to increased cholesterol, which increases your risk. Um, chronic, we're not really going to talk about. Um, they can get like a biliary shock. Um, but I want you to focus on um, the kind of treatment they can get. Like they can get surgery, they can get medications. 
they can have diet changes, they might need diet changes. So the diet, like when they have it, and even after, like if they have surgery, is low fat. That's like the most important thing because you don't want that gallbladder to start contracting again. Um, avoid gas producing foods, so don't eat like Brussels sprouts and broccoli. Um, Non-surgical options include the bile dissolution stabilizing agents, so your sodal or um, chenidol, but um, the most common treatment is going to be the lap coli. Now they can do an ESWL. Remember, you know, make sure they don't have palpitations after. Um, and then the most the most common surgery is your lap coli. Um, when I lived in Cobb County, Georgia. We did so many of these. I couldn't even believe there was a gallbladder left. Um, but they're see how um, bloated this belly looks. They put a, they they put a lot of gas in the abdomen so the surgeon can see better. And so what happens is after surgery that gas travels. You know, gas rises up so they can get stuck in like their thorax, chest, and their shoulder. They can complain of shoulder pain. There's a shoulder pain. So if they complain of pain like that, um, they need to get up and start walking around because that's the best thing to move that gas around. They can resume all their normal activities in one week and they need the low fat diet. All right, so they need to introduce fatty foods one at a time. So the complications um, are, if you see where this, see how these little holes here, the lap holes are? They're not going to want to turn, cough, deep breathe, or use their incentive spirometer because when they breathe, it's going to hurt. So you have to make sure you medicate them um, and make sure you're rolling the patient over to check for bleeding. Best indicator of return of peristalsis is flatus. Remember, not bowel sounds, but flatus. That is the most important thing. Um, this is the ERCP I was talking about before. So they could do this procedure if somebody had a stone um, stuck in their common bile duct. But what's really important about after somebody has one of these, this is like an upper endoscopy procedure, is make sure you're checking for that gag reflex. Very important. Okay, for hepatitis. There's like five different kinds. We're only going to talk about three because that's what you're going to see in the United States, okay? So you're going to need to know how they're, um, how they're transmitted and a few other things. So the signs and symptoms, thankfully, are all the same for each kind, okay? So A is for a bad word that um, helps with fecal matter, and it's, 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 transmitted fecal orally, okay? So somebody doesn't wash their hands after using the bathroom, um, somebody, you know, having anal sex, sexual activity, all these things, contaminated fruits and vegetables, eating um, uh, raw seafood. Um, so all those kinds of things can cause that. Now with A, it's usually self-limiting, and some people don't even realize they have it. Um, good hand washing, they're going to need that. They, to prevent, should have, everybody should have safe, safe sex to prevent hepatitis on uh, every type, okay? Um, A and B have vaccinations. A and B have immunoglobulin. Um, once somebody gets A and B, they have lifelong immunity, but C does not have lifelong immunity. Um, there are no medications to treat A. There are medications for B and C. All right. What we worry about when people have hepatitis is that they're going to progress to cirrhosis and um, liver cancer. So that's the most important thing. Um, for A, if they need contact precautions, you might have to do that, like if they're having diarrhea or something. With B, this is transmitted by uh, blood and I call it booty fluids. Um, so I always remember B is for booty call, but they're going to be on standard precautions. Now it is transferred through um, 
blood, but not sweat and tears. Okay, so blood, but not sweat and tears. Um, they need to practice safe sex, everybody does. Um, needle precautions, um, all that thing. So they have to worry about that. And I think I told you they're on standard precautions. Would C, you can put that in the same category as B. Okay, so blood and bodily fluids. Now the thing with B, it takes six to 24 weeks um, before they know they have it. So they had an incident like six months ago and now they have had B. So that's one of the reasons it's, it's fast growing in our country because sometimes people don't really know they have it. So the signs and symptoms are the same no matter what. So um, abdominal pain, they're gonna be jaundiced. They could have icterus, which is yellowing of the eyes. Um, diarrhea, constipation, changes in the color of their urine. So dark, foamy, or frothy urine in clay-colored stools. They're going to have a fever. You expect that. You're not that worried about it. Um, pain in the right upper quadrant. They'll be really itchy um, because the bile salts leak into the skin. So they're going to need a high-carb, high-calorie, moderate-fat and protein diet. They cannot drink alcohol until the provider allows them to. Um, and sometimes it's like a year after they heal, they can't have alcohol. Um, and, and they're gonna need to alternate periods of activity with the rest because they're gonna be tired. Now, all three types cannot have sex until their antibodies test negative once they have it. Should not share any personal items like towels, drinking utensils, toothbrushes, um, no alcohol, I said that, and uh, no need for a mask, but standard precautions for B and C, and also A, but if somebody has diarrhea with A, you might need to use contact. All right, cirrhosis. Here's the deal with cirrhosis. Now, most of the questions you get are gonna be on end-stage cirrhosis. People can have cirrhosis for like 35 years and not even know it. You know, they go to their provider to have a physical and their, their platelets are low. That could be a thing. Um, and, and they can live for a long time with cirrhosis without really compromising their life. It's when it's in stages when we have problems, okay? So the most common cause of, of uh, cirrhosis is actually hepatitis C. I know everybody associates it with um Leanix, which is alcoholic um, cirrhosis, but really it, it, the highest incidence occurs with hepatitis C. The most definitive way to determine if somebody has it is with a liver biopsy. They may even do that with hepatitis. The complications of a liver biopsy include beating, bleeding and a pneumothorax. Okay? So make sure if anybody has a liver biopsy, you're putting them on their right side so they don't bleed out. Because if you put them on their right side, which is the side that the liver is on, it's gonna help tamponade their bleeding um, after the procedure. So there are some, um, the liver detoxifies um, metabolites in the body. So when ammonia starts building up in the body, they're gonna get encephalopathy. So you're gonna see a high ammonia level and they'll be somnolent they'll have what's called uh, asterisks and i think i have a picture of that um so they'll have um lethargy and fatigue this is asterisks it's uh liver liver flap or wrist flapping is what they call it so they're at first the liver is going to be bigger but then it's going to shrink and get fibrotic um they're going to have slurred speech because of encephalopathy they um, sleep all day and are awake all night. So they have what's called reversal of the sleep-wake schedule. Um, their fluid, they're gonna get ascites. So they're, they're, it almost looks like they're pregnant. But what happens with this is this impedes their breathing. So they can get very uncomfortable breathing and they can develop pleural effusions. Um, they also develop what's called um, Portal hypertension, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Because of portal hypertension, they can get an enlarged spleen. The spleen eats all the blood cells, so it eats the red blood cells, it eats the white blood cells, and it eats the thrombocytes. So they're gonna be at risk for bleeding. 
they're going to be at risk for infection and they're going to be at risk for um, anemia. Okay, because the, the, the spleen acts like a Pac-Man and eats everything up. They're going to have clay colored stools that have hemorrhoids. Um, they can't de detoxify estrogen in their body, so they get red hands, spider angiomas. Um, so those are some of the things they can get. And they're going to get jaundice, and they, they get so itchy, they can really excoriate their skin. Um, and this is purpura. Purpura happens because of the low platelets, but also because the liver makes um, vitamin K dependent clotting factors. So they, the liver can't make clotting factors anymore. And that puts them at high risk for bleeding. They'll have bruising. Here's the, the enlarged spleen, spleen and it acts like a Pac-Man eating all these cells. Okay, so they need to go, if they have encephalopathy, they're going to go on a low protein diet. They can get really bad breath too. Um, they can have weight loss and muscle wasting. So your labs, okay, so your liver function studies in the beginning will be elevated. The bilirubin will be elevated, but the ammonia, if the ammonia is elevated, that's the one you really worry about because they can become obtunded with the encephalopathy. That's what causes the encephalopathy. And their um, protein levels will be low. The liver biopsy, okay, so you do your consent, your timeout, blah, blah, blah. Make sure you got the coagulation studies. Um, you want the patient on the right side after the procedure to enhance the coagulation. And look for um, tachycardia after tachypnea, and low blood pressure, because those are signs of low perfusion. So anybody has end-stage liver disease, they're going to be on a soft food diet. I haven't talked about varices yet, but that's to prevent them from bleeding in their esophagus. Um, they'll be on a low-protein diet. They need low sodium to prevent ascites and daily weights, and it, you need to check abdominal girths, okay? With skin care, no harsh soaps, tepid water, um, put cotton gloves on their hands so they don't scratch themselves silly, and make sure you they undergo bleeding precautions. I talked about end-stage liver disease, no alcohol as well, okay? Portal hypertension, okay, so this causes a lot of things. I talked about splenomegaly. I talked about encephalopathy. It also causes caput medusae, which is like, the veins on the abdomen look like snakes. That's why they call that that. And I think I have a picture on here. And they can get esophageal varices, which they could bleed to death from. So you need to be, um, you need to know the medication involved with that and the treatment. Um, and so, they, yeah, they could be vomiting blood. Okay, the interventions um, to manage hem uh, hemorrhage. Okay, so every patient with cirrhosis gets screened and then they get put on a non-selective beta blocker. There's two medications. You need to know the difference between both of them. Okay, one is called octreotide. This um, decreases the blood flow in the splenetic branch, but that's not what's important. What's important with our triotide, and this is given to, sorry, this is given to patients that have bleeding varices. Our triotide can be given to any patient, whereas vasopressin cannot be given to patients who have coronary artery disease. So you need to monitor for dy uh, dysrhythmias if they're on it, and if they have a history of it, you really have to question that med. So vasopressin and octreotide are the meds that are given to stop variceal bleeding. They can also get like this esophageal um, gastric um, tube, which you blow it up and it tamponades. But the problem with this tube is if this migrates up, they can include their airway. So you have to stay with the patient. They may need blood products. Um, okay. Anybody that swallows blood you're going to be assessing them for encephalopathy because when you have blood in your stomach, your body digests that as protein, okay? When, they, when people with liver disease have a lot of protein,
they get encephalopathy because the liver cannot detoxify the ammonia, which occurs during digestion. Okay, so you need to know that. It's going to increase the BUN. And you would cut that tube I showed you if it occluded the airway to cut the balloon. So vasopressin, don't give it to anybody with chest pain or coronary artery disease and monitor for pain. Octreotide can be given to anybody. Um, and they'll have endoscopic treatments to um, fix the bleeding, okay? The PSE I talked about, this is the encephalopathy. Look for the hand tremors, the asterisks, inability to concentrate. Um, and they'll be emotionally labeled, which means liable, which means they're happy one minute, crazy the next. Okay, so I already talked ascites. Okay, so ascites. With ascites, they can get like furosemide, spirodactone. Um, they you're gonna do INOs. You could do um, monitor their abdominal girth, but they need to be on a low sodium diet. They may have a fluid restriction, but low sodium for sure, because um, it can make them quite uncomfortable. Now, the other thing that they can have is a paracentesis to get if they're having trouble bleeding. Um, and it will all eventually come back, but at least it will make them comfortable. Okay, so you would, you know, monitor for shock. They need to be um, placed supine when they do that. And they need to empty their bladder first before they do that. Watch out for peritonitis. Remember tachycardia, tachypnea. Um, abdominal pain, tenderness, guarding, and that board-like abdomen. Also temperature, obviously, and high blood count. So your patient teaching, they shouldn't have acetaminophen, they shouldn't have alcohol, um, no high-protein foods. They're going to need to take lactulose. That's right. They need to take lactulose to lower the ammonia level. Okay, so uremia has the same signs and symptoms as end-stage renal disease, uh, end-stage liver disease, right? They both can get encephalopathy. They both have anemia. They both have platelet abnormalities. The skin pigmentation in uremia, which is renal disease, is like a tan gray with yellow undertones. It's not quite as bright as the jaundice in end-stage liver disease. They both have anorexia, vomiting. Um, so they, they have similar signs and symptoms. That's just all I'm trying to point out, similar signs and symptoms. So don't like, don't be like, oh, I, I, you don't have to differentiate. They're similar. That's all you really need to know. All right, pancreatitis. It's caused by a lot of different things, but what you need to know is alcohol and biliary obstruction are the two most common reasons people get pancreatitis. Now, pancreatitis means something triggers the pancreas to release the digestive enzymes early. So what happens is, is the pancreas is essentially auto-digesting itself in the areas in the abdominal cavity around it. Okay, so that's the most common reason. Okay, so the pain assessment is be important for you. So usually the pain is in the mid epigastric or left upper quadrant. It does radiate to the back, flank, and shoulder. It's continuous. It, I mean, they're going to tell you it's a 12 out of 10. Um, and the patient's going to guard pain. So this is how you can help the patient. It's made worse by lying supine. So they need to get in the fetal position. Okay. They, they can also sit up lean over a you know a bedside table but bending their knees is important okay um expect the pain to get worse it's going to get a lot of pain the pain's going to get worse we also keep them on bed rest to decrease the pain because you don't want um when when you move around it increases um the metabolic rate and you want to you know have the pancreas very chill so you're going to keep them on bed rest. You're also going to keep them MPO so that the pancreas doesn't get stimulated. Okay. 
Um, you're going to weigh them every day. You're going to watch for weight loss. You're going to look for jaundice. Um, they're going to have a temperature because they have an you know, inflammation of their pancreas. All right. I'm going to teach you about two signs. This right here, bruising on the flanks, is called Gray Turner sign. And if it's bruising around the umbilicus, it's called Cullen sign. And what this means is that there's intraperitoneal or retroperitoneal bleeding. Okay, so you need to, you know, make sure, check your patient's vital signs and stuff. Now, this is, this can happen in pancreatitis, but like this flank bleeding can happen in kidney trauma. It could happen. Um, there's a lot of different reasons this could happen. Collins could happen with like an ectopic pregnancy as well. So th the signs mean intraperitoneal and retroperitoneal bleeding. So remember your order of um, doing your abdominal assessment. That's important. Um, they may have flatus. They may not. So with their labs, they're going to have high amylase and lipase. So that's the most important thing. Um, they'll have a low calcium. That's also important. So your priorities, you want to get fluid into them, do a respiratory assessment because they're going to be at risk for respiratory complications. Um, you, I told you about bed rest. Oh, analgesics. Yes, they need pain medicine, definitely. They need antiemetics, maybe an NG tube. Um, check for your Chavostex and Trosios because of that. Remember the low calcium. Okay, so that's important. And if they go for an ERCP, make sure you're checking the gag after the gag reflex. Now, there is a chronic version of pancreatitis. Um, and what we worry about with that, it's usually caused by alcoholism, is that uh, they're going to go through periods of like exacerbation and remission. And um, we worry that they're going to get type 1 diabetes, which is highly unusual in an adult. But also, um, they're going to be have malabsorption. Okay. So they're going to have steatorrhea, which is those flatty, fatty, fluffy stools. Um, and they're not going to be absorbing their food. So they're going to need pancreatic lipase, which you're going to learn about in pediatrics too, because people with um, cystic fibrosis also have to take these. OK, so they need to take those with all meals and snacks um, and don't put them in protein containing foods. Um, and then the diet in pancreatitis, the most important thing is low fat, no alcohol, caffeine, no smoking. See, it's consistent with all the other diseases. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. You're welcome. So I have um I have videos under your tutoring that you can watch.